you have your Bibles, turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. I want to talk to you tonight about misunderstanding the gospel. Misunderstanding the gospel. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for a beautiful day. Thank you for this past Lord's Day, God. Uh, Lord, you're just here. Uh, we love you. We praise you. We adore you. And uh, God, just be with us in our Bible study tonight. And uh, God, I just uh, pray maybe it would help somebody in a witnessing situation. Uh, Lord, it's so important that we'd be able to recall Scripture and know the text and be able to go straight to the text or even memorize a text. Uh, so God, just watch over us this evening in our Bible study time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Misunderstanding the gospel. Let me give you the outline. Number one, being good will get you into heaven. Okay? There are people that think that. All right? Being good will get you into heaven. My question with that is, how do you know when you're good enough? Okay? Because there's always somebody that, uh, as far as, that's better than you. And, you know, when we compare, we pick people that are worse than us. All right, so there's a problem with both of those. Number two, there are many ways to get to heaven. All right, man, I've heard this statement many times. Okay, you're Baptist, you, you think one thing, but, you know, we're all headed the same direction, and, you know, and there's many ways to get there. And the Bible, of course, uh, does, says that's not true. And number three, being happy is the most important thing in life. And folks, I've, in these situations, in what I'm preaching tonight, I've heard these things probably hundreds of times in 40 years of ministry. People that are uh, not necessarily churched, some have been churched and still say this. But most of this is the world, uh, this is their idea of the gospel. So in Matthew chapter 19, verse 16, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher. Notice how he addresses him, this, this man. What good, uh, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Even the question poses something. What do I have to do? What good thing do I have to do to, to have eternal life? So he said to him, this is Jesus' words, Why do you call me good when no one is good but one that is God? But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Now Jesus knew before this guy walked up to him that the guy was going to walk up to him. Jesus knew before he encountered this person who this person was. Folks, he's God. He's, he was Jesus. He knew what the guy was up to. He knew where this guy was. Okay, so this is not a surprise visit. This is not something that caught Jesus off guard. But the, thing, the two things I say, he talks about Good, good teacher. And Jesus caught that in his ear. So he, he, he says, but no one is good. Psalm chapter 14. Psalm 14, go with me there. Psalm 14, and, and we're going to kind of go. You got to be ready tonight, okay? Several scriptures. Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. All right? If you see somebody that claims to be an atheist, atheist or even agnostic, uh, you have to understand uh, they are lost. They don't know what they're talking about. And it would not be good for you to probably read this and say, you're a fool. That is not a good way to start a witnessing situation. Okay? And it says they are corrupt. And, and by the way, I'm not saying you can't read the Scripture, but just be careful with what you do. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. All right? None. We know what the word none means. None. Nobody. Nobody. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand and who seek God. Folks, when we were lost, we were not seeking God. Okay, you can't tell me the whole time from birth you were seeking God. All right? He comes after us. He looks for us. They have all turned aside. They have altogether uh, become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. The psalmist is saying, hey, Jesus is saying, nobody's good. We were all born in 
to sin. Everyone was born into sin. Everyone had the curse of sin on them. I understand the Adam and Eve thing, folks, but I'm just telling you, everybody, the, the playing field is level. Nobody is good. And the second thing he said, but if you want to enter into life, in, back in our text, keep the commandments. Look at 1 John chapter 2. 1 John 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. Now, by this we know that we know him. This is talking about Christianity. There are several questions asked in 1 John. This, this is a great book on how to know you're saved. How to know you're saved. And this is just one little section out of that. Now, by this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Well, we all know not one of us in here keep every commandment that's in the Bible. We break God's law. But the difference is we have the Holy Spirit in us and we know when we break God's law. So our goal, even as Christians, is to please God in everything we do. But there are people that just say, you know, you know, you know as far as breaking God's law, they'll say, no, that's not breaking God's law. Everybody does that. That's, that's what a lot of people say. They excuse that. But I'm telling you, if you, you're saved, you want to do God's commandments. You want to please God. And then it says, but whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. All right? Commandments is more than just the ten, folks. Commandments is the word of God. Those who are saved want to read the Word of God. They want to keep the Word of God. By this we know that we are in Him, at salvation. He who, he, who, he who says He abides in Him ought Himself to walk just as He walked. What is He saying? Folks, our goal in life should be to be like Jesus. Okay, not like another person. Not just being good. But again, good is, you know, uh, that, that line moves. What may be good to one person is not good to another. And when we compare ourselves to Jesus, you know, none of us are good. We've already established that. But Jesus is saying that desire ought to be in your heart. Now here's where it gets interesting, all right? Look at the rest of this, verse 18. And he said to him, which ones? All right, he almost sounds inquisitive. Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you should not steal, you should not bear false witness. Okay, false witness, you saying you never lied? Okay, just remember that. Honor your father and your mother. The perfect son? I'm not sure one exists besides Jesus. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And here's the statement that blows me away. The young man said, all these things I have kept from my youth what do I still lack? What is he saying? I am near perfect. Okay? And I'm just using the word near. If you read this literally, it probably would say that you are perfect. He never broke any of these commandments. But you know, and I know, this is not true. And what he thought was, if I'm just good, I'm going to get in. Okay? Just be the best you can. Just be the best you can. Be good. Do good. Verse 21, and Jesus said unto him, if you want to be perfect, and again, I think Jesus, is cho Jesus chooses his words carefully, okay? Jesus was perfect. Jesus is in heaven. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. There is nobody else perfect. Never. Zero. Zero. Okay? We've already established that. Go sell what you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven, and come and follow me. See, before that man walked up to Jesus, Jesus knew what his problem was. Okay? It was money. It was things. Okay? So what did Jesus do? He said, okay, you're telling me that you do all this? Well, let me ask you one other question. And Jesus hit him where it hurts. Okay? He was saying, I could do all these things, but don't mess with my money. All right? And Jesus just said, hey, you have to be perfect, which he wasn't. 
And here's what you need to do. Now look at verse 22. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. I hear this all the time. All the time. If you were to die today, would you go to heaven? Well, I'm pretty sure I'll go. Okay, pretty sure? How sure are you? Well, I'm 90% sure. And, I'm, and I've even heard people say I'm 98% sure. I've never, I can't remember or recall a 99, but 98 is about the highest. And do you know what my next question is? You are telling me you're going to take a chance, a 2% chance that you're not going to heaven? And now we can start talking, okay? This guy literally thought, if I'm a good person, if I do good, if I, you know, possibly even go to church. I mean, if you're not breaking in any commandments, you probably went to church sometime, somewhere, okay? You probably helped some people, and they're thinking that goodness will get you into heaven. And Jesus said, listen, you're, you're, you're just lacking one thing, and it's not good enough. Folks, being good is not going to get you into heaven. 1 John 5, just look back at that, 1 John 5. We were in 1 John 2, but look in 1 John 5. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. Have you ever heard anybody say this? Well, if anybody goes to heaven, that dude will go to heaven. Okay? Well, folks, we're not the one that decides. Okay? And I'm not talking about judging people. I'm just saying nobody knows. Okay? And, and, and it, it is not what you do. All right? God knows. For this is the witness of God which he has testified, which has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. What is he talking about? The Holy Spirit. Jesus is in his heart. Jesus. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given his Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. Here's the deal. Eternal life. You want eternal life? Here, here it is. And this life is in his Son. In verse 12, he who has the Son has life. So the question and it is not is, are you good enough? Folks, none of us are good enough to get to heaven. Nobody. There's nobody that can work their way to heaven. We're not good enough. You have to have the Son. You have to have the Son. And then it says, uh, these things, oh, son, ha he, who ha he who has a son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. So this first guy, I'm just telling you, he didn't have life because he did not have the son according to the conversation he had with Jesus. These things I, I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of of the Son of God. Let me ask you a question. question. Do you know that you're married? Guys, be careful about the answer you give that. I don't wake up and say, well, I wonder if I'm married today. We shouldn't wake up and say, well, I wonder if I'm saved today. Okay? We should know these things. First John was written that we may know these things. And this young man thought and misunderstood the gospel thinking if you'll be good, you'll get to heaven. The second thing I want you to see, number two, there are many ways to get to heaven. John chapter 14. I know you know this text, but it, it, is, it is, you know, an awesome text. John chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Folks, we shouldn't worry, all right? You should have assurance of your salvation. You really should. You believe in God. You believe also in me. And I make this statement, and I'm telling you, especially when I do revivals and I'm preaching an evangelistic sermon, I say this, and I'm telling you, it's my testimony. You can't refute this. Ever since I got saved when I was 22 years old, I have never doubted my salvation. Never. I'm not saying everybody does that. I'm simply saying, for me, it was a Saul to Paul thing. My life changed, and it's been changed ever since. No, I'm not perfect, but I'm simply saying it's 100% sure. What does that mean? I, I shouldn't worry about it. I shouldn't 
worry about you know where I'm going or if I'm going to die or if the rapture's going to happen. Man, I'm telling you, I invite the rapture to happen. I want the rapture to happen. Okay? In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. We won't, go get, we won't get into premillennialist, postmillennialist, all millennialist. All right, I'm a pan millennialist. It'll all pan out, folks. Wherever Jesus is, that's where I want to be. All right, wherever He decides to, you know, set the ball in motion, that's where I want to be. And it says, uh, and where I go, you know, and the way, you know. Notice Jesus' words, the way. What were, what were Christians? We're in the book of Acts, folks. And if you don't know this, you have not been listening to me while I'm preaching. What were the first Christians called? It wasn't Christians. The way. The way. All right? Thomas said in him, Lord, we do not know where you are going and how can we know the way? What was Thomas's nickname? Yeah. Doubting Thomas. He was the guy that had been around Jesus. He was the guy, even, you know, unless I see the nail prints, unless I see his side, I'm not going to believe. Okay? Folks, I'm telling you, believe literally by live out our faith and what be, what we believe. All right? Belief is everything. Belief is everything. Faith is everything. We have faith in so many things. I mean, kids will get on a ride that goes 60 miles an hour and double loops three times. you got faith, folks, if you do that. If you've ate out in the last month, You've, you've done, if you've went and got food and took it home, you don't know who cooked it. You don't know what, if they had a permit or not. You don't know what kind of day they had. You don't know what they did to your food. But you still eat it by faith. Folks, that's what salvation, it is true faith. It is believing that Jesus is the Son of God. And he says, Jesus said to him, I love this, I am the way. Well, preacher, you're you're just narrow minded, you know. You preacher, you just you you guys, you know, and again, they use the Baptist word before they use the Christian word. And I am a Christian, I am a Baptist. But more than that, probably the word I like in the gospel is I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I got news for you folks, your Baptist paper ain't gonna get you to heaven either. Okay? Your baptismal certificate is not going to get you to heaven. It's Jesus Christ. I am the way. He didn't say a way. He didn't say some ways. He didn't say one of the many ways. He wasn't bragging. He's simply stating the truth from the Word of God. I am the way, the truth, which is the Word of God and the life. If you look up the word life and the Gospels, I am telling you, it is used hundreds of times. Why? Because Jesus is the way. He is the truth. And He is the life. Now here it is. No one, no exceptions comes to the Father except through me. Folks, there are not many ways to get to heaven. There's only one way. And that is Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Corinthians 2. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 2. Verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom to declaring to you the testimony of God. All right? And, man, there's eloquent preachers. There's, you know, you look at on TV and watch some folks, and there's stadiums and there's arenas just full of preachers. Okay? But their preaching is not what gets people into heaven. It is the Word that they preach. And the Word is the Word of God. And that's what Paul is saying. And here's the second one. For I am determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him 
crucified. Folks, I'm telling you, if you really get down to it on earth, there's nothing, nothing, nothing more important than believing that Jesus is the Son of God, that He was crucified on a cross, and we're only a week or ten days away from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Folks, He's the way, the truth, of the light. He is the only way to be saved. Ephesians 2. You know this one, but I want to point out a couple of words here. Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by works you have been saved. Is that what your Bible says? I don't think so. For by grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Okay? For by grace you have been saved through faith and not that of yourselves. That means you can't get there by yourself. You can't work hard enough. You can't work long enough. You can't clean up enough to get there on your own. It's not you. It's God. Unless God calls you, unless the Holy Spirit pricks your heart, you're not being saved. It's, it's that plain. Lest anyone should boast. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Okay? There ought to be works that follow our salvation experience. But it's all Jesus, folks. It's all Jesus. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, for good works is what it says, not because of good works. All right? And I'm telling you, sometimes when I witness to people, especially people I don't know, they want to give me what I call the, their spiritual resume. It's almost like they're applying for Christianity. Okay, is this enough? Is this enough? Is this enough? And I just let them talk for a while. And then I just hit the big question. Okay, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? And the answer to that, I even qualify that. Because folks, there are many a person in this world that are 12 inches from hell. 12 inches. Say, what? They got it all right here. It's in their head, but Jesus is not in their heart, folks. Okay, I don't care, you know, how long you've went to church. I don't care if your daddy's a preacher or a deacon or whatever. Okay, just because I go and stand in my garage, it doesn't make me a car either. Okay, what have you done with Jesus, folks? It's not your works. And there are not many ways to go to heaven. There's one way, and that is Jesus. Number three. Being happy is the most important thing in life. I cannot tell you how many people believe this. I just cannot share with you how many. There is a lot of people, Christian and non-Christians, who believe this. Look at Luke chapter 12, Luke 12, verse 16. Then he spoke a parable, okay? And, and folks, there's things, I mean, I believe... Luke chapter 16, it, he did not start Luke chapter 16 talking about the rich men that died and went to hell. He did not say this is a parable. He's saying this is a parable, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Meaning, he spoke a parable to them saying, the ground of a certain rich man, notice how he starts it, yielded plentiful, okay? Which tells you he's rich, he's got money, he's got land, he's got crops, he's got all these things, servants. Okay, and folks, it's the American dream. It's the American way. I've been in five uh, countries, foreign countries, and everywhere I've went, somebody in that week or two weeks' times had expressed to me, Americans are rich. You guys are rich. What's it like being able to buy, being able to buy anything you want anytime you want? And I tried to explain to him, uh, that is not a true statement. But this guy was. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? Successful, rich, good investor, had, you know, cat, had everything. If you looked at this guy, you would think, oh man, wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. You know what I found about, about some, and again, you just can't lump 
all the rich people in one category. There are rich Christians. They got a lot of money. God has blessed them, but they still keep God first in their life. So we're not just blanketing rich people. But here's what I found out about many people, not just rich people. What money they have, it's never enough. It's just never enough. They find their happiness in either making money or keeping money. Either making money or keeping money. Verse 19, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have, uh, have many goods laid up for many years. What does that mean? No worries. Okay, there's a recession. <laughs> it ain't going to bother me. All right, if there's a COVID, it ain't going to bother me. All right, many years. Take ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Now here's where I say a description of America is. All right, what do you work all your life for? Retirement. Okay, and there's nothing wrong with retirement, okay? And yeah, man, you want to go look at leaves, you want to go do, you know, whatever. Or you want to win a bagel and see the world. I don't see anything wrong with that. But you must keep God first in your life. First, first, all right? Eat, drink, and be merry. So if there's food on the table, if I've got servants, if I can just order anything I want, if I can get on my jet and fly to Bahamas tomorrow, if I choose, I got it made. Verse 20, but God said to him, there's that word again, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? I just want to say to the world sometime, and, I, and, and, and just simply say, what are you going to take with you? What are you going to take with you? Well, folks, I know one thing you're not taking with you. It won't be your money. Now, you can pack it in the casket. You can be buried in a Cadillac if you want to be buried in a Cadillac. I don't know what that does besides, you know, your kids aren't getting your Cadillac. <laughs> All right? But Jesus was just simply saying, you think you're happy. You pretend that you're happy. You think everything is going your way, but you forgot the most important thing in life. And that is Jesus. You leave this world without Jesus, folks, and you've lost everything. You have literally lost everything. Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose things will these be? Verse 21, so he who lays up treasure for himself is not rich towards God. Mark 8. Mark chapter 8. Verse 35. Mark 8, 35. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And folks, this is what threw the scribes and the Pharisees off. You know, they were thinking literal and they were thinking, really thinking of themselves more than anything else. Okay, what are they talking about? What do you mean to save your life, you got to lose it? Well, I mean, spiritually, you got to die to self. Okay, you just don't swagger up to God and say, here I am, I'm going to be your best. Okay, you just don't do that. All right, you got to lose your life. you got to die to self. You have to come God's way, the way the Bible says. All right? But whosoever loses his life for my sake, and notice this, the Gospels, not just for my sake, but for the sake of others. Die to self, then tell them why you died to self. Then tell them why they can go to heaven too. Then tell them why they're not happy. Let me tell you why you're not happy. You don't have Christ. All right? I, I do not understand people, and it tends to be young people and college people that have said this, and I worked with young people for years, Okay, well, I'm just afraid heaven's going to be boring. I'm just afraid if I, you know, if, if I get saved and all that, it's just going to be a boring life. Folks, they hadn't read the Bible is one thing. Man, there's some exciting stories in the Word of God. They just blow you away if you read them. All right? The miracles of the Gospels. Okay, Lazarus was raised from the dead. I mean, it would not doubt, it would not surprise me for a youth at church camp to say, well, that ain't no big deal. And I'm like, are you crazy? Folks, 
I am more alive today than I've ever been in my life. Why? Because number one, I've settled the issue. I know where I'm going. I know who's taken me there. And I know the way. So everything else is just stuff. It's just stuff. And we put way, way too much emphasis on stuff. Stuff will not make us happy. Our toys will not make us happy. See, when we get older, we just have bigger toys. What is my, what's my Harley? It's a big toy. And, and you you got car convertibles. Don't look at me like you don't have a toy. All right? And it's nothing wrong with that. It's nothing wrong with me doing that. But folks, first, but what does Jesus say? But seek ye first the kingdom of God. Amen. And all these things will be added unto you. Whoever loses my life, loses his life for my sake, the gospels will save, uh, will save it. For what profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? You know how I put it sometimes? And I know it's blunt. Is there really anything worth going to hell over? Is there any possession that you have that you would say, you know what, if you'll give me this my whole life, I'll go to hell. I have yet to meet the person that made that statement. I have yet to meet the person. Okay, and again, you know, you, you have to qualify people. You have to build relationships. You just don't knock people over with the Word of God like that. All right? But that's exactly what he's saying. And then he says, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Really, folks, all in life, all of life that matters is Jesus. And I got news for you. Jesus will make you happy. Even more than Jesus will make you happy, Jesus will give you joy. Amen. Joy. Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. See, I've heard even Christians say, well, I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy. And I understand that. I really do. But as I get older in life, you know what I say? I just want to be holy. I want to be holy. Not so people will look at me, but I want to be holy because, you know, 2 Peter tells us to be holy. 1 Peter, excuse me, tells us to be holy because God is holy. You know what I found out? If you'll get holy, you'll get happy. I'm serious. Man, if you're right with God, if you're walking with Him, if you, there's a spring in your step and you're whistling. I was in the nursing home today and they are opening some up. And I'll share that with you in a little bit. And I heard, a, I heard a guy walking through, had a suit on, and I was checking in at this nursing home, and he was singing a Christian song. Onward, Christian. And he sings a lot better than I do. And I just thought, and I, the guy that was sitting at the table, I said, who was that guy? He, he's our administrator. <laughs> really? An administrator for a, for a rehab place, singing to God. Folks, that man, he's smiling. That man was happy today. Folks, don't look for happiness. Look for Jesus. Look for holiness. And if you find holiness, you will find happiness. Father, thank you for the day. God, I thank you for your word. And your word is yes, it is yes, amen, and so be it. So God, I pray that we just refute these statements, God. I'm telling you, I would say as much as 60 or 65 percent of people in America or really in the world believe these things. And God, I pray that when we get a chance to refute those, when we get a chance to testify, when we get a chance to share, and when somebody asks us, what are you so happy about? Lord, that really just flings open a door to our testimony and to sharing the gospel with someone. God, the happiest day, the happiest day of my life was August 23rd, 1982, when I gave my heart and my life to Jesus Christ. Because everything else is secondary. Everything else is secondary. God, the most important day was the day you wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And God, we're forever grateful for that. So God, help us to help people 
especially help those who misunderstand the gospel. Not with the attitude, I'm going to set them straight. I'm going to just show them. Uh, But Lord, the Bible tells us to tell the truth in love. In love. So Lord, when we get a chance, help us to do it for the gospel's sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.